EV truck startup Atlas Motor Vehicles has some pretty big plans for their all-electric XT full-size pickup trucks and their XP platform. Here's my interview with the CEO and founder of Atlas Motor Vehicles, Mark Hanchett, where we discussed details about the company, future production goals, their XT truck, and also their XP platform. And Mark also revealed details about them wanting to produce their own battery cells. So here's that interview, enjoy. Well, I wanted to take a moment to welcome Mark Hanchett. He's the CEO and founder of Atlas Motor Vehicles. Thank you so much, Mark, for taking a moment to uh, jump on this call with me. Yeah, hey, I appreciate you having me here. Um, this is a lot of fun, so. For sure. Well, I know Atlas Motor Vehicles is somewhat of a new company, and so um, some people have heard of it, some people have not. And part of what I'm trying to do here is get the awareness of this brand out there. I'm excited about the product. It looks like a, a great product, the Atlas XT pickup, and of course, just the platform itself, which we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. But before we dive into those details, the company, um, you know, the battery technology, things like that, that we want to talk about, I want to take a moment and Mark, have you talk a little bit about yourself, um, maybe okay. a minute or two, and then also what you did before Atlas. Right. So, um, I guess I'm a mechanical engineer by education and background. Uh, and prior to Atlas, I actually spent 10 years developing products that truly did change the world. So um, I've never actually worked in a career position where we were developing products that were not sort of life changing. Um, so prior to this, I did everything from the world's first wireless taser projectile uh, that was fired out of a 12 gauge shotgun shell. Um, so that's this concept of alleviating sort of the use of force case of lethal ammunition, right, versus a taser and try to bridge that gap. Uh, and then I ended my career uh, at uh, my prior company to, to Atlas working on officer video camera systems and uh, biometric monitoring, wireless communication, integration, cloud services, mobile apps, everything that sort of defines the world of transparency in law enforcement today, that's my background. So um, everything I've ever done prior to Atlas has been world-changing, life-saving, and uh, sort of trying to continue that here within the automotive uh, technology space and that whole ecosystem that exists there. Most definitely. I, I really like that you have a focus that in, the, in your background, engineering and software and technology, things like that. Um, you know, I think that's really important. I guess not so much as much software, but technology in general. So that gives me a lot of confidence, you know, for the, soft, the, the technology that's going to be built into the Atlas XT. And then once again, you mentioned, you know, it is a life changing, life saving product, and especially, you know, I, I'm all about electric vehicles. Obviously, that's what my channel is about and solar mm -hmm. and, you know, green energy. And right. when we talk about, you know, electric vehicles, trucks, trucks, that's really important because <laughs> that's where a lot of the pollution comes from. Obviously, there's the, the heavy trucks, the semis of the world, but then there's just the average, you know, good, strong work truck, which you guys are making and the platform that other people can build off of. I think that's super important. Um, and it's a huge piece that we really don't have. I know there are a lot of trucks coming, um, but we yes. really right, right at the moment, there is no, you know, mass production or good truck option out there for a contractor or somebody that's a, somebody that's out working with a truck. So I'm excited. I think the Atlas XT could fit that bill. So with that transition, I'd like to now um, just kind of move into the Atlas XT itself. So I'd like to take a moment, talk about the XT truck, and then also okay. talk about the platform itself. Kind of what were you thinking when you brought that truck out, when you um, started designing it? Um, just kind of take us through that process and maybe whatever details you want to share about the XT truck and the XP platform. Uh, yeah, so it's actually, it's fairly straightforward. Um, I'm a truck guy uh, myself. I consider myself a truck guy. Uh, more importantly, I consider myself uh, a person who doesn't necessarily look for something that's a daily commuter. I look for something that is work centric um, in everything that we do. So uh, I'm a big, I own a big diesel pickup truck. Uh, and I got into this thinking, okay, you could build a, a sort of class one, class two A, which is where most of the EV market resides from a pickup truck standpoint, but none of those are really dedicated to the things that we use trucks for. And with the Atlas XT is really focused on that. It's that towing, hauling, 
uh, whether you use it as a contractor, you use it as an individual, you use it as a daily driver, but on the weekends, you like to haul your fifth wheel camper um, up in the mountains, right? Or you want to haul your boat to the lake on the weekend, whatever that is, um, we really wanted to provide a solution that meets that need, but doesn't ask you to make a compromise to accomplish that. So um, I talked a little bit about my background in law enforcement and what we did in that space. Well, what the one thing that taught me there was if you're gonna change the world, you have to do it without compromise. And the XT and uh, the underlying XP platform, the technology that's going into that is really built around that concept. Uh, if we're gonna ask you to get rid of your gas or diesel vehicle, it must be a massive leap forward. It cannot be a leap back with, you know, uh, the, the green movement is fantastic. It's a great message, but if you want to convince people to change, you can't ask them to make compromise. You have to build something that is so far, pushing them so far forward that when they look back, they think, why, why did I ever do that? Um, and that's, that's the core of sort of the mission and theme of, of what we're doing here at Atlas. Yeah, I think that's really good. I think that's, you know, something that Tesla kind of pioneered they brought out an electric vehicle, obviously, after the, the Roadster, the Model S, and it was a no compromises, you know, great sedan. And it sounds like, you know, the, the Atlas XT truck is going to be similar. It's going to be a work truck that'll be able to do a lot of work. I, I, when I was looking at, you know, the specs and the different models that you plan to bring out, I really like that you have one that's actually going to take a gooseneck trailer. Um, that's actually yes. you know, an option you have, you know, with, with 500 mile, you know, estimated range. Um, and we'll talk about battery sizes and stuff in a little bit that could achieve that kind of range. But, you know, I like that, you know, huge towing capacities for that. And, you know, really when it comes down to your pricing, super, your, the pricing you're targeting seems very reasonable when you look at a comparable gas burning or diesel truck today, you know, a high end truck that'll, that'll haul that kind of stuff. It's going to be really mm -hmm. expensive. It's going to be seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 plus, you know, when you add all Correct. the options. So yep. pricing seems good. And we'll talk more about that as well. But, you know, as uh, talking about the XT and the XP platform, um, I kind of, you know, I, I, I'm not really, you know, when I look around, I can't really tell how far along you are um, mm -hmm. with the process of design and everything. Currently, I kind of had questions about, do you have any drivable prototypes? Um, yep. You know, and how far along are you with the, the processes of design? And you had mentioned something about you had some slightly new designs, some updated designs, if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, Atlas is still classified as early stages in the development of the company and the product. Uh, we've been working on it for a few years now. Um, we are customer owned, uh, which is a very unique aspect of the business. Um, so rather than take reservations and pre-orders, uh, we have chosen to go down a different route in the very early stages. Um, where we actually do crowdfunding, uh, equity crowdfunding, where you actually invest in as a angel investor or uh, a sort of a mini venture capitalist within the company. And that's how we've been able to sustain the business and grow the business and move forward. And what that's allowed us to do is we've actually built a uh, prototype of the XP platform, which is a technology demonstration piece, has um, all the different components, pieces of sort of the first drivable prototype of the intended sort of end use case factor or demonstration of what that is. Think of it as a concept slash prototype that's functional, has all the different pieces in there, but it's not production ready yet. There's still a lot of design development and validation, I guess, that has to go through that. Makes um, a lot of sense. Yeah, so you, you have to start somewhere and uh, you have to build the first thing that sort of describes where you wanna go. And that's what we've done up to this point. And now we're shifting into that sort of to market mode where we're stopping all prototype sort of concept work outside of the XT pickup truck itself. And we're moving all of those technology pieces to that production ready state. So that is the current phase that the company is in today. Um, we are a team of 45 people uh, hoping to grow to about 160 this year and then 300 next year. And then a thousand multi thousands after that, of course, over the next several years. Um, and then in terms of the XT pickup truck itself, which goes right on top of that platform that we've built, uh, that is currently in development uh, for that first prototype. And we're hoping, we were hoping to have it this quarter, we had to push back due to some supplier issues. Um, and we'll have that out here in Q2. And then uh, that pushed back our end timeline a little bit into 2022, but that's okay. We've always said that we would start production ramp 
towards the end of 2022 as we try to get larger and larger volumes, but we got to hit those other milestones first. We have to, that prototype and then the production level design, the validation piece, right? And then you launch from there. So it sounds like there's a, there's a possibility still of delivering maybe a few XP platforms to end users. Is that what I'm hearing at the end of this year? At the end of this year, yeah. So at the end of this year, there's uh, absolutely that possibility. Um, our intention is to get the XP platform into um, some core users' hands. We've, yeah. we've got some strategic sort of customers that we're focused on that are uh, more business to business relationship versus business to consumer. Um, and our intention is to get those first prototypes into those customers' hands by the end of this year. Uh, and then there's a little bit of that sort of validation process and everything that happens and then ramps up through 2022, 2023 and beyond. Sure. And just, just to be clear to those watching this, if you're not super familiar with this, there's of course the Finnish XT truck, and then they have built, what are they building an XP platform, which is basically the skateboard technology mm -hmm. that you see without the frame of the truck on top of it. And you can take that and you can add a lot of different custom stuff to it. You can build your own, you know, van, you could take it and build your own probably camper van, RV kind of situation. So think of the XP platform as uh, sort of like the base technology platform, like the phone, the smartphone of the vehicle segment. So it contains everything required to build a vehicle in terms of running, driving, moving, including providing the steering systems, the throttle, you know, pedal assemblies, um, infotainment systems and everything. If you want to integrate that into your specific vehicle. Um, so you simply just kind of plug that thing in, figure out the dash and, and the interior, right? How you're going to plug in those different drive-by-wire systems, all drive-by-wire, um, sort of plop your top on and drive away. And in fact, we, uh, we just did this demonstration for a strategic partner the other day where we took our current buck, which is a tube frame sort of off-road demonstration piece and swapped on a box truck right on top of that. And we did that swap in 18 minutes. Nice. Um, so it's a very much so we're, we're big on plug and play. Uh, we're big on modularity. We're big on simplification of the entire sort of technology suite that goes in there. I think it's really important. Moving back to the XT truck for a minute, the actual truck itself. So you mentioned, you know, maybe at the maybe, you know, sometime in 2022, um, when in 2022 do you think we'll have like a production intent prototype? We'll actually be able to see. I um, mean, you know, a production intent prototype, is that going to be middle or end of 2022? What are we looking for there? Um, I think realistically, we should say uh, publicly, we'll start hinting at it towards the middle of 2022. And then we'll start doing, uh, our intention is the first few customer deliveries for sort of what we would call field trials uh, would start at the end of 2022. Um, uh, we still have a goal and all this is, of course, can we build the team fast enough? Can we raise enough funding and everything fast enough to do this? We have some plans on that later this year uh, that you'll hear more about uh, as we progress. But um, we'd like to get 300 trucks into customers' hands into, in, towards the end of 2022. Um, and these are sort of what we would call beta prototypes. These will be safe, of course, um, but it's... I believe in sort of the crawl, walk, run approach, not waiting until I can do 50,000 a year before we launch. Let's get 300 out there. Let's test it, see what doesn't work, uh, fix that, and then sort of progress and grow from there. That's really good. Um, before we dive into the technology behind the truck and the batteries and stuff, I want to talk a little bit about your production facility. I know you're, yeah. I believe you're leasing a facility in Mesa, Arizona. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that, um, talk about, you know, the space, you know, what this, with the space you have now, you know, roughly how many trucks could you potentially, with a full build out, I know that won't happen for some time, but, but with a full build out, how many trucks could you produce in that space? And, you know, what are future plans there, owning your own building, things like that? Yeah, so um, we're big on vertical integration, of course. Uh, so we are building our own battery cells, our own cell production line, platform, and then a partner for the body in white, at least initially. Long term, we'll bring some of that stuff in house, uh, maybe with a partnership, but we're big on vertical integration. Uh, but we've staged this. So in this facility, which we have 85,000 square feet available uh, with a partner that's going to do body and white in a separate facility, we should be able to produce at least a few thousand trucks per year in this facility. Um, and that's on the low end. We, uh, I think Chris, uh, who's our head of XP and XT, uh, programs here. He's got it planned out for several thousand. 
uh, truck capability just here in the facility that we're at. And then of course, uh, we are looking at um, additional land here in Arizona, as well as a strategic partner back uh, sort of in the Midwest and East Coast. Um, I, I'd be a little bit vague in that because there's two locations there um, that we're looking at where we'd be looking at either a secondary production facility out there. So it's much closer to our customer based on the sort of east side of the country. Uh, and then, of course, a new build out here in the West Coast. Uh, to be able to ramp that up to our target numbers, which we're looking at somewhere in the 50 to 70,000 vehicle range in the next four years per year. Very wonderful. Um, I don't know if you can talk about the body and white partner. I assume that's somebody like Magna or something like that. I don't know if you can talk anything about that. I can't talk about that yet because it's just the agreements aren't in place completely um, from that particular standpoint, but I can tell you that it's staged. So we have a body and white partner that can produce low volume uh, solutions for a relatively low CapEx cost. And then uh, we're in negotiations and talks for that sort of high volume partner that can get us to that next phase. That would also be a partner that would come in uh, into our own uh, one or two facilities that we have in place to be able to ramp up production from that standpoint. Um, and then of course our, our production sort of plan is uh, you have the platform, you have the different technology pieces that go into it, which we can talk about later. Uh, and then of course you have sort of the marrying of those two pieces together that may occur uh, either here or at a different facility. Yeah, it sounds like a smart design, um, working out you know a lot of the, the basic platform yourself and then have somebody do the body and I think that that can make a lot of sense. So um, we're not least, experts yet, yeah. so find yeah. experts in that space. Yeah, I mean, some of that reminds me a little bit of Neo has done a little bit of that with, uh, I think the ES eight mm -hmm. or the ES, I think it was the ES six where they had Magna make some of the you know body the original components. one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a similar there, and you know, Fisker, Fisker is going mm -hmm. with different people to make some of those components. I know you're doing more of the platform than they are, but that seems to be a trend for a lot of new startups now. So. Yeah, there are certain things that you don't want to tackle up front, um, but there are a large number of things that we do want to tackle up front. Um, and a lot of that is around our strategy of reducing our CapEx cost as part of the development yeah. and early manufacturing processes. Uh, but also when we talk about that target price of like 45K, you know, starting price, and then the, the higher end of that, in order for us to do that, we can't outsource a lot of those technology pieces. We lose control of that cost. We also lose control of the simplicity and everything that comes with what we're doing here. Most definitely. And that's something I actually want to talk about in a minute is the, the pricing and stuff. But I, before yeah. we do that, you had mentioned, you know, producing your own battery cells. And I, I think that's a yes. pretty, pretty bold and, you know, <laughs> pretty, pretty uh, hard thing to do. Um, curious on that. Are you going to be doing the whole um, partnering with a battery manufacturer and where you maybe co-own a facility kind of thing? Or are you 100% you're going to hire your own people to make the, the batteries, et cetera? How's that going to look? Roughly, I know so, you can't do all the details, but. Um, I could talk about a lot actually. Okay. Um, so uh, it's, again, it's broken up into phases. So uh, we intend to be a hundred percent in-house uh, manufacturing our own battery cells because part of Atlas's sort of uh, core differentiator at least for the next few years is ultra fast charging. We talk about 15 minute charge times. Um, and to accomplish that, we can't buy an off the shelf cell uh, and get the cycle counts and, and consistent performance and things like that. Uh, it doesn't exist with cylindricals or pouch or prismatic technologies that are out there. Um, but it is a, uh, the way we're staging this is final assembly of the sort of cell itself will happen in-house here in the beginning, but the anode cathode chemistry components will be supplied by a partner uh, as um, sort of finished component sheets in our particular yeah. case. Those will be supplied by a partner and brought here. While over the next two years, we're working on building up manufacturing capability to mix the slurry, create the, um, the anode and cathode components and pieces and the electrolyte pieces um, in-house here in Arizona. And we're looking at some very interesting technologies in that particular space from a long-term perspective, like dry uh, coatings, UV curing coatings and things like that to eliminate sort of the wet processes and the big oven processes and things that are very complicated and make that hard. Um, but we have partners and strategic partners for that large volume 
manufacturing capability partners that uh, worked with Tesla, that worked with battery cell suppliers, that worked with other um, EV companies that are sort of maybe following in the same path out there uh, that are experts in the automation side of that and the manufacturing side of that to come in and work with us. So stage one, partners for the chemistry and the internal components, as well as the other little piece components, will do final assembly. Stage two is to start bringing all that in-house and start high volume production. By 2023 and 2024, we have to be doing 100 million cells per year. And we are not gonna be able to do that with a external supplier, not to mention it is Atlas technology uh, that's going in. It's patent pending sort of cell technology that's very unique to us. Very nice. Uh, form factor, are we talking about cylindrical or are we talking about pouch, uh, prismatic? What are you looking at? Um, think prismatic. Currently, prismatic it's, style, okay. uh, it's more of a rectangle shape. Uh, next iteration will be a cube, which will be a world's first. Cool. Um, no one's ever built a cube cell before. Um, and there's reasons for that. Yeah, that sounds pretty exciting. So very cool. So you've, you've talked a lot about, um, you know, the battery technology. Um, you, I think I saw that you're going to be using an NCM, nickel, cobalt, manganese chemistry. Can you talk a little bit mm -hmm. about why that chemistry and then also how are you going to figure out the fast charging? Is there going to be a lot more silicon in the anode? Like, what are you, what are you doing there for the fast charging? Um, so uh, it is NMC-based chemistry solution. Uh, we're sticking with that at least currently right now uh, because it's it's a great combination of energy, power density, and safety. Um, there are other solutions like NCA or uh, there's new technologies around solid state that are still four or five years away, realistically, mm -hmm. um, where yeah. you're seeing a leap above um, lithium ion cells or NMC, NCA based chemistries. Yes, solid states are in production today, but they're still on par with existing solutions. So not worth chasing that right now. Um, I can tell you that uh, there is a targeted range of around 2000 cycles and current data that we have today says we're hitting between 1500 and 2000, and we'll, we'll share more as we get more data from that standpoint. We target 2000 because we target a million miles mm -hmm. of use, and that's, that's important. super important. Um, and in terms of how we handle fast charging, no silicon additive or additive in the application today. The problem with silicon is the expansion, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually a similar problem to solid state uh, in dealing with that. The way we actually handle fast charging today is very unique. Uh, in the industry. It's a lot of thermal management. Um, it is a lot of that has to do with sort of the charge curve and what we do during charging. Um, and part of that uh, key, and there's a whole hour and a half video, I won't go into details, yeah, but yeah. basically um, the cell design itself and how we design that cell uh, mechanically is what allows us to sort of work around the um, roadblocks that the chemistry presents when it comes to fast charging. So uh, big concerns are always dendrite growth. Mm -hmm. um, it's thermal conditions, right? As you pump more energy in, it gets hotter. Um, those are the two really big ones. And then the last one is cycle life, reductions in cycle life. Yeah. Um, so part of Atlas's proprietary technology is what we do from a thermal management perspective to actually solve all three of those. Um, and then there's some charge curve and profile things that we do uh, to make corrections or fix things when they potentially do go wrong. So if we do detect that uh, there's some dendrite growth in there, there's some things we can do to actually, I guess, for lack of a better term, correct that um, and fix that. Sounds cool. Well, it sounds like maybe in the future we can do a separate interview and we can talk maybe just about battery technology. Uh, oh, yeah. Maybe. I'll talk about that all day. Yeah, yeah, maybe we can do that as a future video, as a follow-up at some point in the, in the coming months. Because that's something definitely on my channel I focused a lot about. And you mentioned, you know, mm -hmm. solid state battery technology. All, there's a lot of hype out there, but I agree with you 100%. It's not going to be ready for five years mm -hmm. or so before you'll actually see that in a vehicle. And to try to get that, just, just waste time right now on that as a startup, I think is is not smart. So I think that's a, that's a wise yeah. way to go. Yep, yeah. Absolutely. For sure. So now I'd like to shift over. So, you know, we've, 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 we've hit on a lot of different things here, the, the truck itself, you know, timing, um, battery technology, but now I want to move back over to the specifications, the pricing and mm -hmm. the kind of the, the re reality of all that. So, you know, I'm not, 
I, I, I think you guys are going to be able to hit it, be able to talk to you guys. I think you're going to be able to deliver what you're saying. But, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of criticism out there for an EV startup where, you know, they say, yeah, it's, it's vaporware. You can throw out all these numbers. You can say, yeah, we're going to deliver a truck that can go 500 miles. We're going to, you know, give that to you for, you know, $50,000. And you can throw all this out there, 15 minute charge. But, you know, how confident are you with the, you know, the towing numbers, um, the charge times, the pricing, like how confident are you that that's, that's going to be, you know, in, in your range, how confident are you that's going to be a reality when it comes out? You can talk about that. So uh, I'm always very confident, but that confidence is sort of built on science. Um, it's not built on, uh, for lack of a better term, like boasting about a capability of what we're going to do and not really understanding whether or not you can actually get there. Um, before I started the company, before I even hired our first engineer, before I uh, went through and started developing some of the pieces of technology, um, we actually, I took an approach of what's the market need and this is basic stuff, right? What's the market need? Where's the pain points? What do we need to do? Where's the technology at? And how do we overcome that? What is it feasible and possible? And you do your whole feasibility study on that. Um, so when we talk about 500 miles of range, uh, or we talk about 15 minute charge time, which I, I touched on earlier when I talked mm -hmm. about battery stuff, um, we talk about towing capability. Uh, we talk about um, price points. All of that work has to go in upfront to understand uh, can you hit those targets? What's realistic? What's not? And if it's not realistic, you don't talk about it um, or you don't set that target. So what we did is when I started um, and then the first few people we started to hire, but even before that, I went through where's the technology at? What do we need to do? What's out there? What are the gaps to cover that? What, how do we cover those gaps and how do we get there? And that was the start. Uh, and then as we've gone through, we've gone through and said, okay, let's prove you can get enough torque out of a motor. Let's prove that you can charge a battery in 15 minutes or less. Let's prove that you can do all these different pieces. And then understanding things like uh, price is built on the battery cell mm -hmm. itself. That is your core driver in price. Definitely. So how do we accomplish that? What's the market doing? How do we bring it in house? How do we hit that target? What volumes do we need to hit with that? Talk to your, it's all this sort of evaluation and feasibility studies that you do on a supply chain side and a technology side to work through that, to make sure you can hit it and then prove the pieces that are sort of the biggest gaps first. And then the other things that uh, are maybe much simpler to prove, but don't warrant time upfront, don't focus on that until you get down the road um, to get there. So that's why we talk about those numbers. That's why I talk about it with confidence because We've done the steps to prove that all of this is possible. Now it's just implementation of that into a sort of mass market product uh, and technology ecosystem. So um, fast charging can occur without high power charging stations. I need a one and a half megawatt station. It doesn't exist. How do I build that um, and go through and sort of walk through it from there like that? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot, lot of infrastructure and stuff that still needs to go, go in. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, Correct. I, just a, a random side note, um, you know, Tesla has been very, very open that they're willing for people to come along and use their supercharging network as long as they, you know, help with the rollout. Is that something that you would ever approach Tesla about, about using their supercharging network? Um, it is. Uh, so what I will say is that um, it, if you want to be a company that's around in 10 years, you have to own the entire product experience, Okay. which means you're going to have to build your, your network. You're going to have to work, figure out how you best integrate with others um, that are out there. Uh, so Atlas has an intention of building our own charging network. We've got a, a plan that's sort of being laid out now. We're evaluating a lot of those different pieces um, because we look at a bigger picture. So we've got our uh, yes, we're a vehicle company. We're also a technology company and an ecosystem company. Um, and we have a plan to build our own charging network. However, uh, we are also in those sort of discussions to integrate with existing networks that are out there. Uh, and as long as that customer experience is very seamless, it's very positive and it works, then we are absolutely going to jump into that. Um, we do know that while Tesla has boasted about that, I will be fully transparent. They are not as open privately as they are publicly. Um, with regards to that, um, there's a lot of caveats to that. That is not to say it's off the table. Um, yeah. It's purely just, there's a lot of sort of discussion that has to yeah. go into that. 
Okay, that's good to know, kind of that little bit of inside view there. Mm -hmm. So uh, one, one last question before we actually dive into the subscription model versus ownership, I wanna close with that. Um, I'm, I am a little bit curious, mm -hmm. you know, it sounds like there's probably going to be two to three battery sizes, roughly, you know, how many, how many battery sizes do you think you're going to have? And what are going to be the rough kilowatt estimates for like that 500 mile range and a, the 300 mile range kind of situation? What are we looking at there? Um, so I'll give you rough numbers are about 150, 200, 250 currently okay. uh, in terms of kilowatt hours of usable capacity for each one of those solutions. Um, when we say 500 miles of range, we do also understand that if you're towing 35,000 pounds, it's not 500 miles yeah. anymore. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and that, that then plays back into charge time, right? If you're going to drive for an hour to two hours, we don't want you to wait two hours to charge. So how do we get that in 15 minutes? Um, but 150, 200, 250. Perfect. Thank you for answering that. And so, yeah, like I mentioned, I just want to move now into, as we close this conversation, um, talk a little bit about the subscription model. It sounds like you'll, you'll have a subscription model and then you also have the option to purchase as well. So if you can talk about those two options, will, will they both be rolled out at the same time? Like, will you be able to, when you launch yes. them, be able to do either and then talk about the, the two models? Yeah, so I, I'm a firm believer that subscription is eating the world uh, in terms of sort of everything that you do even outside of this. Um, it's obviously entertainment. Uh, it has consumed our, our lives, right? Your Netflixes and Hulus and Disney Plus and whatever the, the next one is. Um, you we're starting to see that also in various other different industries, even home ownership. Um, and the, the idea behind subscription is to ease that ownership experience and make it very, very simple. When Atlas looks to the future, we look at individual owners and fleet owners uh, and how do we make their sort of fleet management ownership experience very seamless? So this isn't shared subscription. It's not, I subscribe, I give the vehicle back, my neighbor uses it for a while. This is more, uh, much similar to maybe a lease, but without all, all the headaches, right? When you lease, you sort of rent the opportunity to pay all the expenses associated with ownership, yeah. which is a little backwards. Um, when we think about subscription, we think that in 10 years, 80% of this particular market, especially when we talk about fleet owners or individuals that use their vehicles for work, they're going to be looking for something that they can plan from a budget perspective on a monthly cost basis, uh, what, um, how they sort of manage that vehicle operation. So rather than do a lot of capital up front, they're looking for, I need a vehicle for the next three years. I've got this many people. This is my fleet size. How do I get, let's say, 700 or 1,000 bucks a month? out of my budget so I can start making money right away. Uh, and I have a vehicle where I don't have to worry about maintenance, charging, insurance, any of that stuff. It's very seamless. They focus on their business. We focus on ours and we facilitate that positive ecosystem. Uh, and then that plays into future product offerings that will all sort of work within that ecosystem for us. So subscription for us is how do we take away the pain point of the transition from internal combustion to electric vehicles but how do we deliver the best possible customer experience and value, especially from a long-term perspective? Um, now for individuals that want to buy outright, there's certain reasons why they do that. Maybe they have enough cash. They just don't want a monthly payment um, or a high monthly payment, or there are tax reasons for that, but they're actually still looking for that subscription side of the maintenance insurance and everything else that can come with that. So we're looking at direct purchases. And then on top of that, having that sort of option for subscription to handle all the nuances of vehicle ownership, it would just be at a lower tier price, right? Um, than if you were to do it outright without the initial capital expense. Makes a lot of sense. Well, very cool. I'm, I'm very excited to, uh, to learn more about the Atlas XT and to see, you know, more pictures and videos come out and, you know, I'm more excited about the company now after talking to you and hearing some of the details. And it sounds like you have a, a lot of, you know, good things happening, you have, you know, you have a lot of good plans and it sounds like you're making some really good choices, uh, making the right decisions early on here. So yeah, um, appreciate you coming on. Is there anything that you'd like to, just as we close, anything else that we missed that you'd like to mention? Anything else you'd like to talk about before we go? Um, there's just a few things that we always talk about. Um, yeah. We are, we're still early stages, of course, but we do weekly updates. Um, we are the most transparent uh, EV startup or company I think that exists today. 
Um, so definitely check out the website, check out some of our social media pages. I post a weekly update, which is sometimes exciting, sometimes it's not because work takes time. Um, but we do do those weekly updates. We are a customer owned organization and company. Uh, so um, we are, uh, if you want to be an investor, you want to be a part of the company, you want to be one of those early sort of angels, um, check out the website, uh, invest.atlasmotorvehicles.com and just be a part of this journey. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So it is for sure. It's a very exciting time in electric vehicles. And it reminds me of, you know, the, the, the turn of, you know, to the 20th century when there are, you know, as we looked into like 1900 to, you know, I guess through maybe the very end of the Great Depression, you saw a lot of them go out of business, but there were, there were tons of automotive companies and we're seeing that happen again because of new technology. So very exciting, exciting times ahead. It sounds like for Atlas Motor Vehicles and Mark, thank you so much for the time that you took to come on and talk to us about this. No, appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for watching that interview. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Make sure that if you're not yet subscribed to this channel that you consider subscribing. And also if you did like the video, please consider clicking the like button because that really helps other people find the video as well. I also want to take a moment to thank the Patreon supporters who support me every month and help make this content possible. A special thank you to my performance supporters and also the other supporters listed on the screen. If you'd like to find out more about the Patreon community I've set up, I'll put a link in the description below. Thank you so much.